Good morning, everyone. My name is Monica Naus, and I'm the medical director for immunization programs and vaccine preventable diseases at British Columbia Center for Disease Control. And on behalf of the planning committee and the British Columbia Immunization Committee, I'd like to welcome everybody, both our speakers, our participants, our breakout session organizers uh, to this meeting. Uh, it's this year, it is a Western Canada immunization forum, and we're very happy to be back in person with our colleagues from Yukon through Manitoba, who are here in the room with us and will be participating in the first session of the morning. We have over 200 people registered for in-person, and we have over 500, perhaps 600 people participating virtually as well. So I'd like to welcome our virtual audience as well. And uh, you will be receiving after the meeting a link to the survey evaluation for the forum. It'll take you about five minutes to complete it. Please do complete it because we use the information every year to inform planning for the subsequent forum and we expect this to be an annual event. So please do take the time and there in that email that you receive there will also be a link to your certificate of participation today, should you require that for your continuing education of any kind. Um, uh, this year, we're not going to be using microphones in the room for questions. We're going to be using Slido exclusively. I think many of you are familiar with Slido and you can download the app to your telephone uh, using the a QR code on the front of the program and join Slido at the, the number IMS Forum 2024. So please post your questions there for each of the sessions and the facilitator will select which questions to address to the presenters. You can upvote questions if your question is very similar to one that's already been posted. So you don't have to struggle to get out of your seat and uh, line up at a microphone and we hope that that will be sufficiently interactive but please do post your questions um, and uh, and i'm very happy to welcome our um, gracious elder from the coast salish uh, community sequalia and wanak is here to welcome everybody and to greet you to her lands and thank you very much for coming. Kai Archden, in my Scope Mishoka Meok's Nation, Squamish Nation language, Kai Archden means welcome. And when I raise my hands like this, it means welcome. It can also mean in our Coast Salish way, thank you. So I really thank all of you for being here today on Hoth and Squalwin, Quisclake A, Quichnomi, Tanoyop and Nciayat, to Squall's Deceits. I'm really grateful to all of you that you came here today. And I thank all of the um, UBC, CBD, BC Center for Disease Control, because I know Julene. Provincial Health Services Authority, because Bonnie is one of my friends, I, and um, Immunize BC, for having you all come visit here and come to share together. Chen Chen Dwight, standing and working together to hold each other up and support one another. So, in our way, my grand. I'll share a story and make you relax first. Um, my, um, I saw the first Star Wars when it came out because they showed it again before the second one came out because my children's son was just born in the first one. And so I took them and he was five, his cousin brother was four, my daughter was two and a half. And in the part where it says um, Obi-Wan is giving Luke Skywalker his father's lightsaber. He says, um, your father was a Jedi Knight. And Luke was like, oh, I didn't know. And here's, I'm, I have you his lightsaber. 
And um, Luke was holding it and said, I don't know how to use this. And Obi-Wan says, Jedi's use the force. And the force is an energy that connects everything in creation. And I was um, said, that's our teaching, that's our teaching. To my kids, they were like, shh. <laughs> and I went, well, that's our teaching that great grandpa taught me. And so then um, my grandpa taught, and the reason I say that is every human has a inner energy. My grandpa shared that. It connects us to everything in creation, the sun, the moon, the stars, all the things of the air, land, and water, and each other. So we can send our inner energy, said to each other, no matter where we are, the force. So that's why I have baby Grogu and the Mandalorian. I'm a jet Star Wars. Because if you know indigenous teachings from anywhere, you know that um, you see them when they share it in the movie. And that's what I see. And I have a little voice telling me when I'm down to three minutes and two minutes. So thank you for that. I'm going to get you to stand. Open your hands. See, I made you relax. Do not have them like this or this or this. Now do the downward dog. No. I want you to breathe and ground yourself. No matter where we are, we're on Mother Earth. And we're going to pray for each other. I'll do a bit of um, Sequalia's song, then the prayer, and then turn it back over to Monica and the team. And my apologies, I can't stay for all your presentations. Oh. after Sequalia and the elders named it greeting of the day so I greet we all greet the day now let's say keep your hands open and say I'm going to say chen kwemen tomi kakakanak chesiam yon sion so tunoy up in man man shkwawen to squiles to seats yon sion man man equatal chet yap shkwawen all of their family siaya chet yap shkwawen all of their friends, all of the villages they're originally from and the, where they may have family still living or the villages they live, work, and play in. And I welcome you to the ancestral traditional territories of Squamish Nation, the Musqueam, and Tsleil-Waututh. And so... Our villages were all around here. And I asked Creator to help us all with our squall and the feelings in our hearts and minds and protect your family, friends, and communities. And to be able to help with the squall and what's in your heart and mind, your total being, emotional, mental, physical, and spiritual health and wellness. Asking you, Creator, to watch over everyone as they share their presentations today to those who are speaking and to all who are listening and take in their hearts and minds what's meant for them, set aside what they don't need today to bring back another day. And asking you, Creator, to let us have a yet one whole state's up and excellent work today as we come together in Chomo Chkwawin with one heart, one mind, to Chen Chen Stwite stand and work together to hold each other up and support one another with the transfer of knowledge, information, and being able to share experiences and create positive solutions for the present and future. Asking you, Creator, to see everyone safely home after they 
the end of the gathering. Tama Quitsi Snechem. Those are my words. Now you can sit down. So I thank you for all being here. As I said, Chen Kuan Men told me I'm grateful and thankful to each and every one of you, especially the organizers for having me here to welcome you and just say, Wachayap Yo, you take care and enjoy. Thank you very much for that welcome and for the prayers and for the very positive and generous energy for the day. Um, we also have greetings from our colleagues in Yukon through Manitoba. These are video recorded from individuals who, I think three of them aren't here today, but we do have Sudit Granade from the Yukon here. And uh, these will be from Wanda Abi in Alberta, Sak Dr. Sakib Shahab in Saskatchewan, Dr. Brent Roussin in Manitoba, and uh, Dr. Sudit Ranade from the Yukon, who's also up for the first plenary session, so you'll see him on stage briefly. And uh, these, this video will run on the screen. Hello everyone and welcome to the Western Canada Immunization Forum. My name is Wanda Obi. I'm the Assistant Deputy Minister of Public and Rural Health with the Alberta Ministry of Health. A warm welcome to all of the esteemed public health experts gathered here today and online at the Western Canada Immunization Forum. It's an honour to have such an engaged audience that's dedicated to public health excellence for all Albertans. Today, we come together to share knowledge, experience, and best practices in the field of immunization. We can reflect on the lessons learned from the COVID-19 pandemic and explore strategies to strengthen immunization programs and optimize uptake rates. We can discuss strategies to build trust in immunization and learn about new and exciting vaccines that are on the horizon. I encourage you to use this opportunity to foster collaboration and exchange ideas strengthen our collective efforts towards achieving optimal health outcomes. I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to the organizers, the sponsors, and volunteers who've made this event possible. These events don't happen without a village behind them. Once again, welcome to the Western Immunization Forum. May this gathering inspire you to continue the important work in protecting the health and well-being of our communities through immunization. Thank you. Hi, um, it's so nice to welcome everyone to the Western Immunization Conference. Um, so great that we can uh, all attend either in person or virtually. Uh, you know, I know all of us have been working uh, flat out to uh, get our children and young people caught up with vaccinations and uh, with so much travel now starting and we've all had our share of vaccine preventive diseases presenting, especially after travel, I think it's really important that we all get caught up on our vaccinations, whether childhood or adult vaccines. And plus, you know, all of you attending here today are the experts on vaccination. Patients, parents, families trust you to give them the best advice for themselves and their children. So great to see the topics being covered today. Um, hope you enjoy the conference. Hope you network. We all learn so much from each other and wishing you all the best from Saskatchewan. Thanks. Hi, I'm Brent Rusin, Manitoba's Chief Provincial Public Health Officer. I'd like to welcome everyone to the 2024 Western Canadian Immunization Forum. Uh, we know this has been a challenging few years for public health, and as we start to recover from the pandemic and get back to our core services, we know there's no other area that's going to be more important than vaccines, one of our most important public health interventions. We know the pandemic had a negative impact on our routine vaccine schedules. We saw uh, many of these lag behind, but with the ongoing commitment and the collaboration, we've seen those numbers start to turn around. We know that we have a lot of challenges in front of us uh, with 
vaccines especially, we knew uh, the importance uh, of the effect of uh, disinformation and misinformation, and the pandemic has only escalated those concerns over time. Uh, so we have those uh, challenges ahead of us. Uh, but I wanted to thank you all uh, for your commitment and your expertise in this area and the value of your collaboration and trust gaining that you have uh, earned over the many years that we're going to need uh, moving forward to uh, continue to improve the vaccine uptake uh, for all uh, Canadians. So thanks again uh, for joining us here today and I wish you all the best. Hello, uh, my name is Sudeep Ranade. I'm the Chief Medical Officer of Health of the Yukon, and I want to wish you all a very warm welcome to this conference. A special hello to my friends and colleagues who are from the Yukon. Hello, I'm probably sitting at your table right now, so this is a little awkward. But uh, welcome to all the provinces and territories you've come. I hope it's a great conference. Uh, have a great day. That was the movie star at the very end, right? <laughs> um, so those are fantastic welcomes. And last but not least, the welcome from British Columbia will be given by Dr. Bonnie Henry, our provincial health officer who needs no introduction and who has been a great ally of immunization programs for her entire career in public health and probably even before that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> It's wonderful to be here again today, and I, I just want to say what they said. <laughs> um, but just uh, welcome everybody, and thanks to Sequalia. I know she had to leave. We share a love of Mandalorian fans, though I'm a Boca Tan Crees fan myself. <laughs> um, and uh, I just want to acknowledge that we are here gathered and on the traditional and unceded territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and tsleil tooth peoples. And I think it's important for us to remember and to acknowledge the original inhabitants and keepers of these lands and waters and I always take these opportunities to reflect on on my privilege as a white settler in this country and I can come from uh, Mi'kmaq territory on the far far east in uh, Prince Edward Island and when I reflect on this I reflect on the fact that I come from Scottish her um, heritage and my family was kicked out of Scotland by the aristocracy and we're um, fortunate enough to land here in Canada and I benefited from that in many many ways and sadly it has been at the cost to the the people that were the original inhabitants of these lands so these are things that we've tried to do in our office and in the BC CDC to reflect on um, the unearned disadvantage that First Nations Métis and Inuit people have in this country and to acknowledge the inherent rights of BC First Nations um, that stretch to every inch of this province and, and this country. Also want to recognize the inherent rights to health that we um, need to uphold for all First Nations, Métis and Inuit people who call these lands and waters home. I think it's important for us to reflect in our daily work the things that we can do to reconcile the injustices of the past and dismantle the systems that keep others out and keep others down. And, and much of the work that we do is really to that end, to try and bring up and, and bring forth the health of all. And I just was reflecting this morning as well that it's four years next week since the pandemic was declared. Four years. Oof. Seems like a lot longer. <laughs> it's been hard on us, I think. <laughs> Um, and how wonderful it is. I remember when these started, we started these first meetings, uh, 2016, 2017, I can't even remember now, the before times, <laughs> you know? And then how wonderful it was to come back together last year and to be together and actually talk together and then even more so this year. Um, I want, uh, you know, the impact of the pandemic on immunization is something we're going to talk about this morning. We're going to hear from the wisdom in this room and from those online. And it's no more critical than it is now as we're seeing this discourse around anti-vaccine, which is not new to us, but it is in a different way right now. And we see me measles rearing its head again, as it does 
when people don't pay attention, when we have pockets of people who don't believe in these immunizations, or where we have dismantling of our systems or weakness in public health systems that we're seeing around the globe that have not yet caught up from the, the issues of the last four years. So how do we stay calm and kind and, and address those very real fears that people have? And we've all seen that, um, fomented, as we know, by misinformation. Um, that's things we've been dealing with for a long time. But even more challenging now are these intentional um, disinformation or lies that people are spreading about vaccination. It makes our job really difficult. It makes those conversations really hard sometimes when people become so wedded to their ideas and the things that, that they've heard. So we do need to rebuild trust. I think all of us have talked about that. But while the polls show that trust in, in vaccination may have gone down, it also shows that trust in you People still trust their healthcare providers, their nurses, the physicians, the pharmacists, the people they have in contact with to give them good, credible advice. So the things that we can do in having those conversations with people, you know, as Saqib says, their trust in healthcare providers remains strong. And we have the tools and we can't step away from these critically important conversations. We need to have those conversations with every individual because the work we do is so important. And we'll be hearing today about all these important issues. And more importantly, we're coming together with this common cause that we believe in immunizations. We know that these make a difference in people's lives, the lives of our communities across the globe. And we do whatever we can to protect the health people in our communities, whether they're our elders and seniors who've been so affected in the last few years, the children that we care about, the children in our communities, to give them the best start that they have in life. And so I didn't plan this with Sequalia either, but I did have my words are to, you know, lifting each other up, supporting each other and having these difficult conversations right now. And coming together today is a way to do that. It's a way to listen to each other, to learn from each other, from what we've been through, and to hold each other up as we do this important work together. So thank you all for being here, and I look forward to having the conversations with you today. Thank you very much for that welcome as well. And... Um, so I, uh, I was reflecting, uh, as, as I was coming home last night in a beautiful sunny day, I thought it's my friends from the prairies who have brought the sunshine <laughs> today. Uh, I think it's maybe appropriately clouded over so that we don't feel cooped up in a room without windows. So, uh, but at our first session, we will have an opportunity to hear from our friends from the prairies as well as the Yukon. And we look forward to that session. And to moderate that session, I'd like to introduce you to Julene Cranch, who's our senior practice lead in the immunization programs at the BC Centre for Disease Control. Thank you, Monica. And I also want to say thank you so much to Sequalia for opening us up in such a good way. When I saw her this morning, I, I told her I always, I always feel better when she's in the room to start us off. And thank you also for all the well, one, wonderfully warm welcomings. So I have the pleasure to introduce the first session, Impacts of the Pandemic on Immunization. We'll first have a presentation and then we'll move into a, a panel discussion with partners from across Western Canada. So I encourage you to use Slido uh, to submit your, your questions or upvote them if you have a similar question and you'll find that QR code in the program. You'll also find the full speaker bios in the program. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Dr. Shannon McDonald, Associate Professor in Nursing at the University of Alberta. Uh, to start us off, she's going to talk to the impacts of the pandemic on vaccine uptake, attitudes, and future of immunization strategies. So welcome, Shannon. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Henry just reminded me there's another Dr. Shannon McDonald in BC who's a much more prestigious person than I. So if you are expecting her, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's the, it's the, prairie, the prairie version that you get. 
So uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to come today. I feel actually a little bit intimidated about presenting to such a knowledgeable group. I feel like a lot of what I'm going to say, you're just going to be nodding your heads like we know that. Um, but I hope there'll be some nuggets that I can share or maybe different ways of framing things that you can take away and apply um, in your work going forward. Um, and I also wanted to acknowledge, you know, that I, I appreciated the welcome as well um, to this ancestral and unceded territory of the Coast Salish people, um, which is, believe it or not, closer to spring than we are. Um, I'm from um, uh, Treaty Area 6 and Métis Region 4, where we are absolutely blanketed in snow. So um, the fact that you have daffodils blooming, even if they're covered in a, a, a bit of snow, is still a, a step ahead of us. <laughs> And I have no conflict of interest to declare. So in my presentation, what I hope to do is present some of the broader context into which the panelists um, can um, present their provincial and territorial specific information. First of all, I'm going to talk a bit about, of course, how the pandemic impacted routine immunization coverage, as well as attitudes, and then spend a bit of time talking about strategies that have been used to catch up vaccinations post-pandemic, but also to reflect on strategies that we used during the pandemic for increasing COVID vaccination that maybe we could um, embrace a little more moving forward. Um, in order to not you know, duplicate what our panelists have, have to share, I'm gonna focus largely on a global context, a national context with a smattering of Eastern Canadian um, data. Um, but I can't resist presenting some Alberta data because that's where the work of my, my research team is. So as we all know too well, uh, during the pandemic, countries across the world noted these drops in infant vaccine coverage due to pandemic-related lockdowns. Canada uh, is no different, um, but there's some interesting differences by jurisdiction that I thought I'd note. So um, the published information up to date is is mostly from the early pandemic period so this is what i'm going to reference for this part here so data from quebec showed that pandemic related closures really had a large a large impact particularly on 18 month vaccines and then coverage rebounded quite quickly and came back to close to pre-pandemic levels um, alberta what we saw is some fluctuation of coverage with changes in pandemic closures and um, in ontario they saw some sustained decrease in two and seven year olds and pretty good recovery in the two year olds, but not so much in the seven year olds, um, which I'll talk a bit more about. So I just wanted to highlight the fact that we see differences in jurisdictions, partly because of the different vaccination processes and providers we see in those different provinces. So when we see um, a province like Ontario, where primary care offices like uh, pediatricians and family doctors are providing a lot of the vaccines, when those um, offices shut down during the pandemic, vaccinations just ground to a halt. In other settings, Alberta being one of them, where public health is the provider for infant vaccines, we were able to do sort of a quick readjustment within a couple of days and open up vaccination clinics again um, with just, um, you know, some adjustments, of course, to, to keep everybody safe. So some of the patterns we see reflect that difference in, in providers. I do also think it's important to note that there's differences in the tracking of vaccine records that occurred in those different provinces. So when you see differences by province, they may be real differences or they may be the result of the inability um, to track records. So for instance, in Ontario, information on coverage for seven-year-olds is reliant on parents submitting their records, records to public health. And um, public health wasn't chasing those records during the pandemic. And if any of you have been watching the news, public health is now chasing those records. So, you know, there's been thousands and thousands of families, you know, um, risking exclusion from school because their records haven't been submitted. So when we talk about seven-year-old coverage not having recovered, part of that is just that we don't have records of vaccination. So I think it's always important to keep, keep track of the distinction between the two. So school best school-based vaccine delivery for adolescent vaccines in, in normal times is really a largely effective approach aside from the problematic consent process for any of you who have tried to keep track of the bundles of papers and the bottoms of the backpacks. Um, but 
at school-based delivery still is an effective approach, particularly around improving equity and vaccine access, so ensuring that kids of all income levels have the same access to vaccines. But of course, when schools close to in-person attendance, it's really hard to vaccinate kids online. Um, so that's where we saw a real, we really got um, a huge impact. So sharing some data from Alberta, just as an example from HPV vaccination, we saw these very significant drops in coverage the findings on the screen are actually from the master's thesis work of Hannah Sell, who I think is somewhere in this room. I haven't, oh, there she is, hello. Hannah was a master's student with me um, before joining the BCCDC, and this was her thesis work. So I just want to make sure I give credit to her and point out that she has a poster here today. So um, what I want to point out here is, you know, that first um, pandemic year, of course, our second dose of HPV vaccine coverage just plummeted because nobody got it. Um, in the second year, as, as kids were online, offline, online, offline, we, of course, had trouble getting in there to get kids vaccinated. So we didn't want to sort of leave it at that. We wanted to see, okay, what's happened since then. So we followed the kids from the first pandemic year over um, from July of 2020 to September of 2021 to see what kind of recovery we got. And it was impressive how public health was catching up these kids while the pandemic was still ongoing. But you can see that um, it does not they didn't quite get back to the pre-pandemic year and certainly not back to the level where we would like them to be. We've never actually reached 90%, but that's where we would like them to be. So just to say kudos to public health for, for getting them that far, um, but recognizing that there's still a ways to go. And then this is some data from Public Health Ontario uh, from their 2023 report that shows two-dose HPV vaccine coverage in the dotted blue line. Um, and you see the, see the significant drop from uh, a 60% coverage prior to the pandemic down to 5.8% in the first year and 26 in the second year of the pandemic, and then a recovery coming after there. Uh, looking at Quebec, so Quebec did some interesting analyses, not just looking at coverage, but how it's impacted different populations differently. So HPV and Hep B vaccine coverage in Quebec almost returned to pre-pandemic levels by 2022. But what they did is they teased apart kids um, who came from areas with um, high deprivation and low deprivation. And as you can see, the recovery was much better for, um, for kids with low deprivation uh, compared to high deprivation. And they did a similar analysis looking um, at neighborhood um, proportion of immigrants in the neighborhood. And again, you see the recovery is quite different for kids um, from those from those neighborhoods. So I think it's just uh, important to remember, again, this is all about like nuance. And this is a crowd that can understand that nuance that, you know, you can't just look at coverage overall. You have to sort of look at who, who we're talking about in subpopulations. So we all know um, that the COVID-19 pandemic had an impact um, on parental perceptions of routine vaccines. And I want to dig a little bit more into that. What I'm showing here is a framework developed by the WHO. Some of you have probably seen it before, but it is a newer framework. It, it more or less replaces the three C's framework that we're all probably more familiar with, the one that says complacency, confidence, and convenience is what impacts vaccine hesitancy. And the thing I like about this newer model is it really teases apart vaccine hesitancy as a precursor to vaccine uptake. It doesn't mix the two together. So vaccine uptake is that gray box on the right, which is the behavior of getting vaccinated. So you can see the orange box motivation um, to be vaccinated is influenced by more than just risks, um, perception of risks and benefits, but involves other issues around thinking and feeling and social processes that influence that motivation. The thing I wanna highlight about this at this time, and we'll come back to this figure later, is that during a public health crisis like the pandemic, individuals are making really crucial decisions based on incomplete information. And in those situations, trust is really, really fundamental. So misinformation doesn't take root unless there's a lack of trust. So trust is really at the core of it. And that's trust in the products, in the providers, and in the institutions. What I'm showing you here, this is um, a figure produced in UNICEF's State of the World's Children 2023 that was released um, 
about six months ago. Um, and it talks about the impact of the pandemic on vaccine confidence. And it drew from um, some data collected in what's called the Vaccine Confidence Project based out of um, the UK. What they did here is they consolidated data from surveys conducted in countries around the world. And the figure here shows the percentage change in respondents agreeing that vaccines are important for children. So for instance, the red shows that there's been more than a 10% drop in the belief that vaccines are important for children. So that's just to orient you um, to the figure. So what you see here is in the vast majority of countries where they had data, there is um, at least a 5% drop in, in people believing vaccines are important for children. And in Canada, the drop was about 9%, from 91% to 82%. One of the reasons I want to show this to you, though, again, as a, as a more discerning audience, I want to sort of point out some caveats. And just to point out to you, it's really important to read the fine print. So when you look at this report, you might think, oh, you know, people don't like, don't trust routine vaccines anymore. First of all, it's important to note that the question wasn't asked specifically of parents. This was a question of the general public asking about vaccines for children. So I'm not saying that's not important, but it's quite different than asking a parent about their children. So um, just keep that in mind. And the other point is that the report didn't differentiate between COVID vaccines and childhood vaccines. It just asked, do you think vaccines are important for children? So as we all know, the attitudes around COVID vaccines are quite different than uh, routine vaccines. So when you see reports like this and sometimes the media just pulls out a figure and pops it in a news article, it's important to really look at the background information to say, um, you know, what, what information fed this, um, this figure. So um, our team also um, looked at this, in Al so this is a study based in Alberta, but uh, as part of a national uh, survey. And the data I'm showing you here is led, was a project led by Robin Humble, who is also somewhere in this room over there, who is a PhD student that I supervise, but she's based on Vancouver Island, and she's about to graduate and might be looking for a job. <laughs> um, so you can go find her at her poster if you would like to meet Robin. So in this pan-Canadian survey, which we conducted in October and November of 2021 uh, with parents of children zero to 17 years of age, um, we asked parents whether or not their attitudes about routine vaccines had changed. And as you can see, um, quite a large proportion, you know, 75-ish percent of parents said the pandemic had not changed their attitudes towards routine vaccines. And um, if you look at the top bars there, you can see that almost 25% of parents said that in fact the pandemic made them think that routine vaccines were more important. Okay, so, you know, there's certainly data on both sides of the fence, so uh, this is just some information that I'm sharing with you. Um, but I also want to show you the information from the um, Public Health Agency of Canada's Childhood National Immunization Coverage Survey, CNICS, for those of you who, whoever, uh, who work with it. So what's shown on the red bars is that about 18% of parents said that they thought vaccines were more important for their children and about 80% who hadn't changed their attitudes. So just something to keep in mind that um, we, we, we shouldn't be make, making an assumption that, um, that uh, concern has increased. Um, during the survey we did in 2021, this is again from Robin's work, we specifically sought out populations with particular identities that are often thought to have lower vaccine um, acceptance. So respondents who self-identified as Indigenous, including First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, racialized minorities, and newcomers. And what you see here is that, um, well, 81% of the reference group didn't change their attitudes um, about their vaccines. Both racialized and indigenous populations um, had a lower proportion that didn't change their attitude because in fact, they increased um, their trust in vaccinations or their belief that vaccinations were important. So again, we can't make assumptions and say these populations who are often underserved by us as providers, to be honest, themselves have concerns. It could be more about things like access and other barriers. And um, this slide, which is a little, bit, a little bit busy, so I'll just walk you through it a little bit. This is a study um, from the US. Um, and if you look at the blue horizontal bars, 
those indicate negative, the level of negative vaccine attitudes. And you can see that negative vaccine attitudes actually dropped immediately after the pandemic started and then sort of rebounded back to the place it was. And the main thing I'm pointing out here is that these things fluctuate. So, you know, we have to be careful about using data that's a couple of years old because um, public sentiment has shifted. So just be mindful that there's, there's fluctuations there. And then a few other points that I'm, I'm guessing a lot of you have probably seen in your clinical practice. So other things we've seen, increased polarization. And by that I mean that the beliefs at either end of the spectrum of vaccine confidence seem to have become much more entrenched. The folks who are really concerned about vaccines have just doubled down and the folks who are supportive of vaccines are actually becoming more vocal about their support of vaccines. So I know personally I've seen that um, myself. We've also seen there's this stigma around COVID vaccines. So when we've tried to go into schools to get routine vaccines, there's this message from parents that, you know, when I agree to a routine vaccine, I'm not agreeing to a COVID vaccine. Don't assume that I'm accepting, you know, the COVID vaccine. So we just have to be careful about mixing those two together and making sure parents know what it is that we're asking to vaccinate their, their kids against. Another key point is what we've seen is a, a disruption of passive acceptance. So we used to, you know, there used to be a huge proportion of parents who just, I'm supposed to vaccinate my kid, so I vaccinate my kid. And now those questions, those parents are asking questions. And I don't think we should feel threatened by those questions. I don't think we should think that because they're asking questions, they're vaccine hesitant. It just means they're, they're less passive about the decision around vaccination. And the other piece of that is around vaccine fatigue. So. I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm tired of some days I'm tired of thinking about vaccines and parents certainly are tired of thinking about them, talking about them, getting them. And I think, again, we have to be careful not to label somebody like that as vaccine hesitant. They're just tired of constantly having to make these decisions and have these conversations. So this is just sort of a, a point to say, don't, don't mash together all sorts of different things and, and be labeling parents. Um, and then I was thrilled that Bonnie mentioned this. Um, on the positive side, all the studies out there still show that trust in healthcare providers is high. Um, physicians, nurses, alternative healthcare providers, pharmacists, midwives, trust is up. Trust in institutions is a bit on the downslide. So when we talk about you know, the, the institution of the health authority, the institution of the government, trust is not as high. But you as individuals are trusted. So use that for sure to your advantage. So just a few points to emphasize um, of what I've talked about there is that the evidence on whether the pandemic has, has created population level changes in vaccine attitudes is still a bit unclear. So we need to keep, um, keep looking for evidence to, that changes over time to, to understand where we stand. Um, we need to be discerning about the evidence and, and look at the small print when we look at these reports. Um, and it's important to note that these attitudes aren't static and are changing. Um, and it's also really important to remember that a positive attitude towards vaccines doesn't always translate into a behavior. So you might have parents who think vaccines are great, but if we're not doing a good job of providing them in an accessible way, um, they, the child isn't getting vaccinated. So that leads me to bring you back to this model. And this is, this is the part that I really, in my own research, this is what I often focus on, is as a system, how are we doing in removing um, access barriers? So there's, you know, questions about, you know, do parents even know what vaccines their child is due for now? So I, I'm constantly asked by my friends, like, how do I know if I, my kid missed a vaccine during the pandemic, you know, because they weren't in school? So we need to make sure we're doing a good job about reminding um, setting up reminders about vaccines and then of course making the vaccines accessible in locations and times that parents can access. Um, because those practical issues can actually lead back into motivation. If we as a system don't show that we're going to do everything we can to get your child vaccinated, that sends a message to the parents that says, well, if, if you're not going to, if you're going to make it so hard for me to do it, why am I going to bother? So we have to be careful how our system level issues can lead back into that motivation. So the pandemic has highlighted the importance of considering all of these barriers when working to improve vaccine uptake. 
the pandemic created the impetus for many health jurisdictions to implement strategies that maybe they had said can't do it before. I know that was the case in Alberta. There were lots of things we've been pushing for that just never happened until the pandemic and then all of a sudden it was possible. Um, so I think what we've really learned is there's things we never thought we could do that we could do and that we need to build some resilience into our immunization programs. We need to invest in strengthening our national immunization and jurisdictional immunization infrastructures. So what are some of these strategies? So it isn't just about supplying information, and I believe we have a speaker later today who's going to talk about um, misinformation. Um, really, we need to um, build that trust and the confidence in, in vaccines and in the people that provide vaccines in order for people to approach information from that position of trust. Um, in the first place, politicians and, ex and medical experts need to be mindful of the distinction between vaccine hesitant and anti-vaccine. We never want to just like lump somebody in as anti-vaccine because they're asking legitimate questions or questions that we think are maybe not legitimate, but don't immediately assume that they're anti-vaccine, especially in the context of uncertainty. So I remember when the pandemic first started and vaccines were just on the horizon, the number of media interviews I did where people where the reporters asked, you know, do you think parents are being vaccine, do you think parents will be vaccine hesitant? And I said, honestly, you're talking to me as a parent and you're saying, would I vaccinate with my child with a vaccine that hasn't been developed yet, that they have no idea if it's effective, they don't know if it's safe. I'd be crazy if I wasn't hesitant. So judging parents in a context of uncertainty is, is not the way to go. We really have to approach this from an empathetic, um, an empathetic stance. Um, certainly, um, when we have culturally and linguistically appropriate educational materials, that really shows um, communities that we're making an effort, that, they, that we're trying to reach them in a language that they're most comfortable in speaking. Um, I think the pandemic has um, resulted in the development of a lot of great pr provider um, training opportunities and I know the BCCDC has been a leader in, in a lot of those strategies. You just go to the, the website, I often send people to the BCCDC website for those resources. And I think another thing we've really learned is about community engagement. I, I can't think of a time, you know, pre-pandemic where we would have approached so many community leaders or religious leaders or whatnot to ask them to support us in our in our different strategies to to reach their um, uh, to reach their communities so an important area of innovation that occurred during the pandemic I think really is reaching people where they're at so I always use this analogy when I'm talking to people in Alberta so for a youth to get HPV vaccination in Alberta, they have to either be in school when the vaccine is provided, or they have to get themselves to a public health center to get the vaccine. So if you have a young person who has been skipping school, who has an unstable health, you know, home life, and, you know, to the extreme is perhaps, you know, living on the street, and we ask them to walk into my local Bonnie Doon public health center where the mommy and baby clinics are, that's really an unrealistic ask. So I think we need to um, learn some of, take some of what we've learned from the pandemic about reaching people where they're at and think about how we can apply that with some of our um, vaccine programs going forward. COVID certainly resulted in lots of opportunities to utilize digital technologies and there were some great sessions at the Canadian Immunization Conference um, last April about this. Um, prompts and reminders are, you know, shown to be extremely effective and I'm going to share a little story with you from some data we had in Alberta that was really eye-opening. We looked at the impact the pandemic had on rotavirus vaccine coverage and we saw that um, coverage had dipped but then third dose coverage had this astronomical increase at the six-month mark to the point that third dose rotavirus coverage was higher than it was pre-pandemic and we thought what on earth is going on here? So we started calling public health you know, zones and asking, you know, were you guys doing something that resulted in this? And it was public health nurses, and I'll, I choke up really easily, so I might cry. Public health nurses were calling parents to say, your child's about to age out of rotavirus, and if you don't get them in, they miss it. Sorry, I, like, I really cry easily. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I just, I find it such a powerful story that in the midst of a pandemic, these public health nurses are phoning parents one-on-one -on -one and saying, you know, get in here so your kid doesn't miss out. So we saw this great increase in rotavirus vaccine coverage. And I think, gosh, if we had the ongoing resources to do that um, going forward, that would be fantastic. <laughs> So kudos to all of you. <laughs> yeah. Um, Decision-making tools are another area that we can use digital technology for sure. Um, they have, of course, have to be you know um, well developed so that parents who are on the fence don't feel that they're just being coerced into vaccinating. So they're they're a challenging one, but there's some great resources being developed there. And. A couple of points just about context in our existing delivery system. So we have great school-based programs across the country. There's lots of rules attached to what kids can vac get vaccinated at what age and what grades. And one of the things that is happening in some jurisdictions is some flexibility on those rules in order to not lose those kids before they leave school. So an example being um, in Alberta, we don't typically vaccinate in high school. We don't really have high school vaccination programs, but there was an investment of resources for public health nurses to either go into high schools or at least contact high school students to get them their vaccines before they aged out of the program. The other um, innovation that's happening, um, I know in Ontario, they've raised the age of eligibility for a number of vaccines so that kids that normally would have aged out of a vaccine at the age of 18 can now get it at older ages. Other jurisdictions have just outright, you know, raised the age. So HPV vaccination, some provinces, you can now get it till 26 years of age. So that gives us a chance to catch up those kids. But in jurisdictions where it's not an across the board increase, I think it's an important consideration to think about um, temporarily at least raising the age of eligibility so we can track these kids down at community colleges or universities or whatnot once they've left high school. Um, for infant programs, the strategies really depend on whether or not you're a physician delivery model or a public health delivery model. Um, reminder systems within, you know, like in Alberta, we have, you know, just public health delivery, so reminder systems are a little easier to implement. But I think, you know, there's lots of physician offices that use, you know, electronic medical records that could absolutely implement those um, strategies within their existing model of delivery. And I just realized I talked a bit about this already, so I'm just going to move past one. this one. This is around vaccine eligibility and changing schedules. Um, so context um, around data systems. So ultimately, and I started the, the talk mentioning this, and I'll, I'll wrap it up talking about this, to be able to implement, target, and evaluate interventions, we need to have data. Um, there's no point in us all trying something new because we don't have any data or ev evaluation to show that something worked somewhere and we could adopt it somewhere else. There's been some great innovations in data systems as a result of the pandemic. So Ontario, you know, developed the, I always get this wrong, COVAX on registry where they had all the COVID uh, vaccines in a single registry where prior to that vaccinations were scattered in a really regional approach. And it would be great to see those provincial level strategies, um, data systems being used for routine vaccinations. Um, in Alberta, uh, our First Nations data often sat individually with the First Nations communities. And as a result of the need for vaccine passports, but we don't call them that in Alberta, um, a lot of communities signed data sharing agreements with the Ministry of Health and now that data for both COVID and childhood vaccines is flowing to the ministry which allows us to have complete records for First Nations children who are living on reserve. So I think there's some great innovations that um, happen and give us that ability to evaluate interventions. So in conclusion, the COVID-19 pan pandemic really illustrated the importance of a responsive, resilient immunization system across Canada. Programs that have the ability, as our Chief Public Health Officer stated, uh, programs that have the ability to withstand major shocks and disruptions, quickly adapt to changing circumstances, and maintain high uptake and acceptance over time is really what our goal is. The pandemic caused these drops in vaccine coverage and recovery is certainly has varied across jurisdictions and our panelists are going to share more with us about that. The pandemic also challenged everyone involved in public health to reimagine routine vaccinations and think creatively about ways to recover and improve coverage. That innovative mindset really needs to remain. We need to continue to adapt, 
and evolve routine immunization programs to meet the needs of our communities with the goal of ensuring nobody is left behind. And I'll just end with thanks to some uh, current and past members of my team, and I couldn't resist putting their provincial flags in there just to show that we've covered three of the five Western uh, provinces and territories um, uh, with the work that we've done. So that's the end of my presentation, and I really look forward to hearing from the real experts from each of the provinces. Thank you so much, Shannon. Um, sure, yeah. Sure. There. Yeah, that sounds great. Um, so I'm just going to check with the team in the back. Uh, Michelle, are, did any questions come in uh, through Slido for Shannon? Uh, yes, so we do have a question. Um, so in regards to the parent attitude about routine immunization change, um, for the unchanged, uh, is there a difference between those who had positive versus negative prior attitudes? I'm trying to interpret the question. So there... If I, if I can go back to the figure, I don't know if I can. It might have to go too far. Um, basically what we saw is that about 80% had unchanged attitudes and then there was a very small percentage who um, had changed their attitude but it, was, it became more negative. But the vast majority that changed their attitude, actually it became more positive. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Um, we also have another question um, about how we can increase trust in healthcare institutions that deliver vaccinations. Yeah, that's a tricky one. Um, I'm, I'm a very sort of relationship focused person. Like all the work I do is focused on relationships and I don't make relationships with institutions. I make relationships with individuals. So I think from, and this is just my personal perspective, I think if, if we build trust in the individuals who work within institutions, we gradually develop trust in the institutions. There is, of course, and people who, um, Sequilia actually said she had a business degree, and I wish she was here to answer this question, <laughs> because there are you know, strategies for building trust in organizations and things around transparency and you know, you know, doing what you say you're going to do, et cetera, certainly are, are of benefit there. But I think from our perspective, most of us in this room are face-to-face are -face with individuals, and that's where we build trust. And through building trust with individuals, hopefully they come to trust the organizations that we're affiliated with. Thank you. Um, we have another question, um, it, which is, uh, how can we get more resources for rural and remote BC to do this work? Um, and by this work, I assume this means um, promoting immunizations. Funding isn't always equitable, and how can we make it more equitable? And this might be a big question as well. <laughs> might be a question for the lady in the front row. <laughs> <laughs> One of the ladies in the front row. Yeah, that's a tricky one. I mean, one thing I certainly learned, so any, I'm very much a quantitative researcher, and when you do quantitative research, you don't always get the why to, to the answer, so I end up making a lot of phone calls to understand the why. So I'm always calling different health centers and just finding out what they do, and the thing that struck me is that the, the context completely changes how, how they operate. So there were some regions in rural Alberta where they weren't busy rolling out COVID vaccines, so they had the capacity to keep childhood vaccines up. There were other rural regions where they just gave up on school-based vaccines for three years and just said, we're not even going to worry about them because, you know, we just can't. So I think what I'm getting at is that it's not a one-size-fits-all. So I think there's ways with your resources that you have to try and find some strategies. But I'm with you. The more financial and human, honestly, the human resources is the message I've heard more than anything, is having, you know, temporary staff come in and help support was really instrumental in a lot of these programs. So I guess I'm saying I'm with you, I hear you, we all do the best we can with what we've got. Perfect. Great. Okay. Actually step down for a second now, of course. Thank you so much, Shannon. That really helped to set the stage for our panel discussion. Um, so Shannon's going to join us uh, back up on this stage, but I'm also going to welcome the rest of our uh, panel participants. 
And just a reminder that their full bios are in your program if you'd like to refer to them. Uh, you'll also note near the end of the program uh, that you'll find uh, some of the childhood immunization coverage in time of uh, COVID for some of the provinces. So I'd like to welcome to the stage Dr. Monica Nouse. Medical Director of the Immunization and Vaccine Preventable Diseases Service at BC Centre for Disease Control in BC. Carrie Bergstrom. <laughs> Carrie Bergstrom, Director of Immunization with the Public and Rural Health Division of Alberta. Maury Granger, Senior Public Health Nursing Consultant with Saskatchewan Ministry of Health. <laughs> Dr. Devinder Singh, Medical Officer of Health for Manitoba's Southern Health, Sante Sud region. Dr. Sudit Ranade, uh, Chief Medical Officer of Health for Yukon Territory. And welcome back to, uh, to the stage, Shannon. Thanks. So to start us off, I'm going to uh, pose a question uh, to each region. So what specific challenges and successes have you observed in the immunization efforts within your province, territory during the pandemic, and specifically in terms of the pandemic's impact on routine immunizations? And perhaps I'll hand it to Monica to start us off. Thanks very much, Jolene. Um, so we debated putting the information that's in the program on the slides, and we decided not to go through any of the numbers in detail. But you'll see from the coverage in British Columbia, and these are reports that are going to be published shortly, that we did have sizable declines. Shannon pointed out what happened to HPV, and we definitely saw a huge decline in series completion during the period that schools were actually closed because services couldn't be delivered during that time. But for the most part, I think we've caught up uh, in the most recent data. You'll see that we're almost, even though maybe not quite, at pre-pandemic levels. And so we still have some small residual declines in many of our assessments and cohorts. But I think we're very hopeful that over time, those will be caught up. And there were huge efforts made by regional health authorities in British Columbia to chase after kids who had been missed during the pandemic years because of those interruptions in service. And the older cohorts were specifically uh, targeted. So we do immunize in grade seven and grade nine routinely, but grade, sorry, grade six and grade nine, but grade sevens and grade uh, tens were pursued in the years after they had missed their doses. And uh, I think that there is an expectation of increases. Having said that, we've been trying very hard for many years to get to 95% in this province, and we haven't yet reached that for any of our vaccine programs. One of the things, though, that's emerging in our data, which is registry-based, is that we have a very large proportion, 11% in age seven, of kids with no record on file with public health. And this is in a... I guess five years, uh, almost five years after implementation of something called the Vaccine Status Reporting Regulation, which rolled out in British Columbia in July of 2019 and was supposed to fix that problem. And it's basically a requirement that parents must provide a record of their child's immunization to public health. And for vaccines that those children are missing, they should also document the refusal. And of course, the rollout of that was interrupted because of the COVID pandemic, and this is work that we need to get back to. So I think it is an opportunity for us, even though to what extent we're going to be successful in retrieving all of those missing records is a little bit unclear. Specifically, this will be a program without penalties. And you're probably very familiar with the Ontario model where at the end of the road, there is a child suspended from school if a parent doesn't comply with the record provision. Uh, in British Columbia, the decision has been made not to have any of those penalties. So largely, it will remain a very voluntary process using a lot of the strategies, the low barrier 
strategies that Shannon was describing in her presentation, one of the innovations, you know, I keep trying to think of the silver linings of COVID. So one of the silver linings of COVID has been the creation of a central portal for intake of immunization records in British Columbia. And that was set up originally when we were all having pa vaccine passports and had to prove that we'd been vaccinated in order to go to places like restaurants and for healthcare workers as well. And so that portal has been expanded to other vaccines now and is used uh, for uh, childhood records as well. And another, I think, important opportunity for us, as long as we have primary care immunizers who are using EMRs to document immunization, is to build those bridges between EMRs. Because it's, it's unreasonable to expect a parent to provide the child's record over and over and over again when the healthcare system has captured that record already <laughs> in some system. So I think we have to work much better to build those kinds of bridges. One of the findings on an EMR review that was concluded in British Columbia was the discovery that despite the fact that we have only about six EMRs operating in primary care, each of them has about 30 different data standards that they're using for documenting vaccines. So there's not a common data standard that's used in those. And that's something that I think could be readily remedied. I'll pass it over to Sidi for oh, my microphone <laughs> on and off. Sidi to uh, comment on Yukon. Sure. Um, hi, everyone. Can you hear me? No, not yet. OK, so just give me a second. I'm number three. Okay. OK, great. Thank you. Um, <laughs> So uh, in the Yukon, we have also experienced uh, a very similar uh, decline in, in routine childhood immunization rates during the pandemic. I, I just want to emphasize that my personal perspective on this is not that this is like, this, I believe this is a normal consequence of what we would expect because of all of the things that happen. So this is not like, oh, this is a, you know, um, something we didn't, predict or feel like it was going to happen. And now we have to understand the, the, like the magnitude of that difference, right? Whether it's real or not. And so one of the reasons why we haven't really um, uh, put together, you know, presentable data on this is because when we dig into the, the data quality, there are questions about sort of, you know, what's, how certain are we about that numerator? How certain are we about that denominator? How legitimate is that difference, um, you know, in, in real terms, in terms of what the consequences or the impact will be? So in the Yukon, we have a delivery system that is largely focused, uh, like it's, it's more centralized. So it's akin to sort of, you have a public health delivery model. Um, our, our primary care uh, clinicians do not routinely administer vaccines, and there are some that are administered through pharmacies, but primarily it's centralized. So the advantages of that model are you can actually drive changes, but there are disadvantages in terms of sort of access and disadvantages in terms of, um, you know, tailoring things when everything's done through one, one uh, center or site. So we're going to work through some of those things over the next few years. Um, but I, you know, I also am highly, highly cognizant of the fact that, um, and I'm probably going to say this for another year or maybe two, depending, you know, like, like, you know, what do they say? Like when you break up with someone, it takes like half the amount of time of the relationship to like get over it. Right. So, so this is kind of like that, right? Like the job of public health is to help everybody else get through this thing, which we did. And so in a public health emergency, you would expect that public health systems are going to be the last to recover because they have spent all this other time helping everyone else, right? So all of this work that we're saying, oh, we have to do this, we have to do this, we have to do this, is coming on top of a bunch of people who have spent three and a half years going, we have to do this, we have to do this for everyone else. I, and I'm not saying that we don't have to do it. I'm just saying we have to be compassionate about that. We have to understand that this is the place that the people who are now working in public health are coming from. And so now we have to go, how big is this issue? What's the impact of this issue? What's the time frame that we have to manage this issue? And maybe move ourselves away from that kind of like COVID and this and this. Like, you know, we can't translate that response into everything we do. We actually have to go back and go like, right? Like immunization and and coverage rates are not a this March break issue. 
they are a long-term issue that has happened for decades that we have to work on, that we have to have strategies for. And so, so we just have to take a step back and go back to like what we did in public health before we became wrapped up in COVID, right? Which is let's go back and analyze the problem. Let's go back and figure it. And that's why I really valued your presentation today, Shannon, because there's so much analysis about where can we take our programs to understand where folks are coming from in a geographic sense, but also in, a, in an attitudinal sense, right? I think I'll just stop there. <laughs> Thank you so much. And we'll pass it over to Devinder to comment from Manitoba. Great. Thanks, Julian. And I'll echo the comments of the previous presenters. I won't try to repeat too much of it. And again, I want to thank Shannon for pointing out that this requires an examination of the nuance. So in Manitoba, there's different provider mixes depending on where in the province you are. So in Winnipeg, the immunizations for early childhood immunizations are largely delivered by primary care. So by nurse practitioners, physicians, uh, family physicians, or pediatricians. Whereas outside of Winnipeg, the early childhood immunizations are largely administered by public health, so public health nurses. And we see the impact of immunization rates you know, mirrors what was what happened to those providers during the pandemic. So, uh, public health, as many of you know, was you know retasked, reassigned to uh, combat the pandemic in ways that primary care, you know, wasn't uh, retasked in the same way. They had their own challenges, but they were different. And so, we had much more significant drops in our early childhood immunization rates in areas where public health was the primary immunizer. Uh, so, you know, when we look at the initial impact outside of Winnipeg, it was much more dramatic than in Winnipeg. And then when we had our catch-up efforts, which are, you know, have been ongoing for, you know, years now, we saw that in Winnipeg, we actually, for many of our immunizations, compared to just before the pandemic, we haven't seen a significant drop. Whereas outside of Winnipeg, there is still a difference. And we still have a lot of unknowns, and that's part of the challenge of, you know, with that difference, how much of it is due to residual access issues. And we've tried to um, narrow that gap by expanding service for early childhood immunization in areas outside of Winnipeg through special clinics, longer hours, especially into the evening that, you know, try to make access um, for parents and families that wouldn't necessarily have been able to access, you know, Monday to Friday, you know, nine to five, uh, because that doesn't work for a lot of people. Um, but with, even with all those efforts, we still see that there is some residual difference. And we, I think that, they, that we just don't know what the reasons for that are. So it'll be important in, you know, now and in the coming years to try to understand if that's just due to specific access barriers or there's attitudinal shifts that either are more amenable to change like you know maybe there's more questions but once those questions are answered by a trusted um, provider that they can be overcome versus you know more entrenched beliefs that even with uh, you know answers to their questions still are not amenable to change very easily. Um, and I think that, you know, just to carry that forward, one of the challenges that we're experiencing in Manitoba and is likely a challenge elsewhere is a significant shortage of primary care. So it's, it's excellent if you have a trusted healthcare professional that can answer your questions. And so you might miss one opportunity to be immunized, but if you have uh, you know, repeated conversations with that trusted person, then you might be able to um, get immunized at one of those subsequent visits and subsequent conversations. But if you don't have a primary health care provider and you're not having those conversations, then there's that much less of a chance that you'll be able to have someone trusted in your life that that is promoting immunizations. So. That's a challenge that we notice more acutely in different areas of Manitoba um, and is more acutely uh, present in rural Manitoba than it is in uh, our urban setting. So, uh, you know, I 
suspect that that also plays a significant role, but that's part of the lack of knowledge and understanding that we're trying to gain to try to understand why there's still residual deficits. Uh, and I'll just end by saying that one success or positive thing is that we already knew, but it's just reinforced, is the benefit of having a really strong immunization registry. In Manitoba, we've been fortunate. We've had a centralized immunization registry since 1988, I believe. It was the Manitoba Immunization Management System, MIMS, and then now it's the Public Health Information Management System, FIMS. Um, but <laughs> all of the records from the earlier system were imported into this newest one, and we don't have the issue of, um, you know, the missing records in the same way that Dr. Naus was talking about for BC. You know, there's still obviously issues with making sure that you have an accurate, comprehensive registry system, and there, I think there always will be. But we are able to track in real time, you know, where things are at for different communities, you know, down to the public health office level. So, you know, that really helps a lot in trying to, in real time, provide information to public health offices about which families they need to reach out to. And, you know, it can list for each, um, uh, each child or young person in that office catchment area all of the immunizations that 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 person would be overdue for. So, you know, again, just allows those tools for those offices, assuming that they have the human resources to be able to respond to it, um, to, you know, really target those efforts to those families who might be experiencing, you know, some barrier or another to try to uh, get those children immunized and provide other services to them. So um, I'll just leave it there for Manitoba. Thank you so much. And Morag for Saskatchewan, do you have some comments? Thank you. So I would like to also echo what everybody else has said. In Saskatchewan, public health does the vast majority of immunizations. So we have a handful of physicians who do it, but it's very, very few. Um, we also use uh, Panorama, which is much like FIMS, um, and it is done in real time. It is direct entry into the uh, registry. We don't have a feed from uh, any physicians that do it, though, so it does affect that if we have uh, physicians do it. It ends up being back entry. But we also do reminder recalls, um, so we can print off reminder recall lists. The um, Saskatchewan Health Authority does that, and then public health will do the follow-up. Public health in the past used to do the postnatal visits, and that is a perfect place to develop those relationships with those families and those trusting relationships. Unfortunately, during the pandemic, that kind of went by the wayside a bit, and it is time, I think, to get back to that. Also, as in many other provinces, our STBBI rates have increased substantially, so that causes a shift of public health capacity over to address those as well. So we are struggling a bit with our public health capacity to do some of this and to do the follow-up, and I think that's where we need to focus our efforts on, on um, putting more people into that work. Our rates did decline. They are slowly coming up but it is a very slow, gradual um, return back to the pre-pandemic levels. Um, one thing that did come up during the pandemic was our First Nations partners. Actually, most of them, I think, if not all of them, are now using Panorama, so it's fabulous. We are able to look to see what's going on in the First Nations communities as well. And we are able to drill down right to the neighborhood levels, as um, the vendor had mentioned and determine which neighborhoods really need the focus. Because we do have some neighborhoods that are doing very, very well, and some neighborhoods that really need some extra attention. Um, we did, during the pandemic, also standardize a lot of our information around COVID. Um, the Saskatchewan Health Authority has a clinical standards department, and so we worked very closely with them to make sure that what we were saying is what they were saying, so that people don't get confused. because. There is a lot of um, issue with not getting constant and consistent information. So we have to make sure that that happens. Um, and a lot of outreach strategies have happened during the pandemic and happened before. So increasing our um, 
availability to clinics. So a lot of evening clinics, weekend clinics, outreach clinics. They used mobile vans, mobile clinics, going to areas uh, where people um, can't access immunizations. So they were actually driving to those areas and setting up clinics in those areas. And they're continuing to do that for routine vaccines. Um, and I think that is about it. Lots of communication strategies as well through our communications departments. So I know the Saskatchewan Health Authority is doing a lot of work on that. They're putting Facebook posts, um, Twitter posts, or X, I guess is the new name for it. And um, those are getting a lot of hits as well. So we're really trying to reach people where they're at and through the social media and the means that we need to. Thank you. Thank you, Morag, and I'll pass it to Carrie to share Alberta's. Oh, good. I don't know if you can. Oh, there we are. Thank you. Um, so, uh, Shannon, I just wanted to say thank you for your presentation. It was great, and I, I've learned already from you. Um, so, similar to my panelists up here, the the immunization rates in in children in Alberta um, have slowly declined because of the pandemic. Um, in particular, the ones in the, the serial ones like the hepatitis B and, and HPV. And as Shannon had showed in her in her presentation, they really dropped down. And Alberta Health Services, who is the service delivery arm uh, in, in Alberta, put in additional resources. Um, they did a very good job and, and increased those rates. And we're hoping to see even more increase. Um, again, not where we probably should be at the 90%, but um, we are working our way there. Um, the other thing that um, is important to note that we also, in addition to having one body, which is our public health at Alberta Health Services, do the work, they also were the providers of the pandemic response. And so similar to what was already said is they are also in recovery mode, but they still managed to make the phone calls and put out the, the recall letters and send out the text messages to, to do what they know they need to do to get these rates increased and to bring people in to be immunized. So I, I'm uh, very grateful for the work that they've done there. The other thing that we have a good advantage of in Alberta is we have a, a central repository for all of our, our immunization data and all providers um, submit immunization information into the repository and that gives us our coverage rates. And as a result of the pandemic, we have now First Nations information coming in. So that gives us a, a bigger, better picture of what's going on in our immunization uh, coverage in Alberta and where we need to do some work. Um, the other thing that um, I, I just want to point out, because we had one regional health authority um, that we could work with when, when changes needed to be made or when changes do need to be made. We have one body that we can coordinate with and that is, a, that is a huge benefit that we saw through the pandemic, not only with respect to vaccine logistics and distribution and setting up clinics, but also in, in writing policy and developing policy so that we can increase those rates and get really creative in, in how we can um, work together to, to increase our childhood immunization rates. And Sudita, I couldn't agree more with what you said about um, retired and the people that responded to the pandemic are the ones that are expected to you know, increase these rates. And I think it is in the front of their mind and, and they are looking at strategies. And, um, and I think we're gonna, we're gonna get there. So, and that's it for me, thank you. Thank you so much. And some of you spoke to this a bit already, but I'm just curious if there's any other thoughts about how the experiences during the pandemic have informed your approach to immunization strategies and public health policies moving forward. I, I'd really like to talk a little more and ask my colleagues about other silver linings of the COVID pandemic, because we've heard a little bit about that and whether you know, some of the activities that were done because of the COVID pandemic are going to stay on and assist with some aspects of our programs. So for instance, in British Columbia, one of the things that was enabled, and I think there had been years and years and years of work 
with not much progress, but all of a sudden, a variety of data sets became available, ministry data sets became available to the BC Centre for Disease Control. And one of the, and it's not so much about immunization coverage, but it is about vaccine safety. So it's enabled uh, the use of administrative data, linking health uh, event data, discharge abstracts, hospital separation data, to immunization registries to be able to assess the association between vaccination and specific outcomes, rare outcomes, like Guillain-Barre syndrome, for instance. And that's something that I think had been in the works in Canada as long as I've been in public health. There's been talk about trying to do this and trying to understand, well, since we are, since we're different from the United States, we have publicly funded healthcare systems, why can't we do this work? It's never been done. <laughs> now, now all, I think Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences in Ontario, Manitoba, I think, has had good uh, information, right, to enable that in the past. But in British Columbia, it's really been uh, quite an uphill climb. So I'm hopeful that that's uh, a residual ability that we're going to retain in the system. The other um, thing, I think we've talked a bit about immunization registry enhancements. And I think despite some challenges, one of the things that was enabled during the COVID uh, campaign has been electronic reminders and recalls. And this is something we've been talking about for childhood immunization for years and years. Everybody here talked about telephoning parents. <laughs> And, and yeah, okay, you can do that. But in this day and age, if some of those parents would respond to an electronic reminder and recall, isn't that sort of the low-hanging fruit? And, and if we can maintain systems uh, with either you know mobile numbers or email addresses, can that be done? And there is a project underway in British Columbia now, and we've got people from our Panorama team or FIS team here who are working on digital consent as well, so that th those consents don't have to, you, we talked about, we always talk about backpacks, right? Pieces of paper <laughs> in backpacks that never get home. Uh, so if some, some of that information can flow in ways that people are accustomed to using now, then that's another sort of silver lining, I think. Are there any others? <laughs> I, c I could probably comment. Um, so one thing that was stood up rather quickly in Alberta during the, the pandemic was uh, a booking system whereby Albertans could go in and book uh, their COVID vaccines and then we added influenza vaccine and it, w it was a lot of work and, and I think in the beginning it was because we tried to put in clinical eligibility rules as well. And if you recall, the COVID vaccines were crazy with their eligibility rules and to try and build a booking system around that just about killed us. But so, so all that to say that I think it was a valuable tool for Albertans and, and now that it's, it's a, we've kind of removed all of the clinical pieces and it's purely a booking system, there is also a reminder, uh, text messaging reminder component to it that, um, that, that could be used. And so, you know, Albertans are used to it now. I think they, they may like it. We haven't done a survey to say if they do or don't like it, but we know they use it. So that's, that's probably a tool we could, we could likely leverage um, if, if, you know, for recalls and reminders. Um, and, and there is also work going on with our IMARI, we call it, that's our immunization repository, to, to create functionality and um, real-time integration with, with our pharmacies so that we can get, and, and physician clinics, but that's, that's later on, but so that we can get some, some uh, good information from our pharmacy providers as well. I could um, just provide some input from Manitoba, is I think that the, some of the silver linings for the pandemic is that it, it confirms some of the things that we're doing that are beneficial, for example, um, you know, we in Manitoba, we don't have sort of an aging out of a vaccine. We've had a policy for many years that once you're eligible, you're always eligible. So in some ways, it makes some of the vaccine el eligibility, you know, uh, not quite correspond with some of the recommendations from the Canadian Immunization Guide because they might extend to people of ages where, you know, it's no longer still necessarily recommended. 
but they would still be eligible in a number for a number of vaccines. So um, for people that have had their immunization schedules disrupted for any reason, then you know that does help if they uh, there is an opportunity to catch that person up that they're still el eligible and they don't have to have that financial barrier at least to purchase the vaccine uh, in order to be immunized. Uh, and you know as well, it uh, you know confirms the benefits of the registry in terms of we have our physician billings and our um, pharmacist dispensing for um, immunizations uh, that goes into the registry. So that has been helpful to make it more comprehensive. Again, there's still issues with you know incorrect billings, for example, those would be incorrectly entered into the registry. But overall, I would say that it's beneficial. But in terms of some of the new things that happened during the pandemic that were silver linings is are those advancements in the technology that I think were already happening, but were accelerated to a great degree. So a number of uh, my panelist colleagues have talked about um, Panorama. So that's still the same. The public health FIMS, the public health information management system is Panorama. So. You know, ideally that could be leveraged to more of a pan-Canadian integration of information because we know that people relocating from one jurisdiction to another jurisdiction is, is you know, making sure that there's accurate information about that individual's immunization records is a significant challenge and just, you know, falls to the family to essentially submit those records in. And we know that, you know, adding any other barrier just just increases the likelihood that you're going to have, um, you know, a lack of, of accurate information and lack of access or opportunities for that person to be accurately um, assessed for their immunization needs. Um, and then as well is that online portal. I think every jurisdiction maybe has come up with an online portal because of the requirement for that COVID vaccine passport, whatever your jurisdiction happened to name it. And so I think that there's interest across all of those jurisdictions likely, and there's interest in Manitoba of extending that because you know the next stage of having a, a comprehensive electronic registry is a registry that's actually um, accessible and visible to those individuals and those families to be able to get their information in real time so they don't have to go to a pharmacist or a physician or another health, uh, public health office to get a printout of their record just to know what they have um, if they don't have that little cart that happened that they carry around with them, right? So um, we know that uh, that, that has um, challenges and barriers. So those are just some of the, you know, advancements and accelerations that occurred during the pandemic that I think are some of those silver linings. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm hearing a lot of discussion about our immunization registry. <laughs> and I think we all recognize the value of that. There's been a couple of questions coming in from Slido specifically for BC about one, one central repository for immunizations or EMRs. As, as you mentioned, Monica, there's a variety. Um, and I think as well, the, the piece about access that, that Shannon, you spoke to as well, I'm wondering like even the access to a record, right? Like that, that's part of it for, the, so it's not fully put on the family, right? Um, so yeah, really interesting. I guess you also mentioned about the, the na a national <laughs> registry. Does anyone have any comments about that or where we go? I can, I can mention that, uh, let me think, Jill Riedick and I, have participated in two calls now uh, of a committee that's being co-chaired by the federal government and the chief provincial health officer in Ontario, Karen Moore. I think Bonnie was going to be the, the co-chair, but it's overall overarching. And I can't exactly remember what it's called, but it, it is a federal provincial territorial data exchange around immunization records. We've had two calls. I, I'm going to um, suspend my optimism about it. Just, I, I don't mean to be pessimistic. The first call, I think we had an opportunity to sort of put our wish list on the table and to say, it's supposed to last two years, this committee. And I said, if at the end of two years, we don't have something up and running, then we will have failed. 
because I don't just want, just want to go to a bunch of teleconferences for two years. And, and, uh, and I've also said I really want to exchange records with Alberta, Alberta and Ontario because that is where our biggest mobility is in this province. So if we need to get pilot projects off the ground, let's get going. Like, let's do it now because they have registries and, and that's our biggest fan. <laughs> Um, and, and on the second call, uh, it became apparent that the feds want the data. <laughs> and, and so that's, that's where I'm, that's where I'm uh, so suspending my optimism on this. Because it's always been very clear, and I was a participant in this, there's a consensus statement published in the Canada Communicable Disease Report back in 95 or 96 on immunization registries. And the wish that was very clearly stated, and this is going back a long time now, was exchange, interprovincial, interjurisdictional exchange of immunization records, but not a national immunization registry. And so I think that that principle needs to be embedded. We're prepared to report, you know, aggregate information, share coverage information with the federal government, and so on. But I don't think we're supportive of reporting record level data to the federal government. It's just not how we're set up in this country. So we'll see where that goes, but I'm hopeful. I am hopeful <laughs> and I'm hoping that the, the provincial co-chair will be able to rein in the objectives for it. Thanks, Monica. I think we'll, we'll shift the, the theme of the question just slightly for our last 10 minutes. Um, so what are the predictions and plans for a future of immunization in your province territory considering potential change or challenges such as vaccine hesitancy, misinformation, disinformation, and the need for sustained preparedness in the post-pandemic era? So just open the floor to anyone who has any comments on that. <laughs> <laughs> This is a prediction? Like, what are the chain? Um, or, or plans. Get your crystal ball out. Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm going to, can I, can I, is that okay? Okay. So rather than a prediction, I'm going to, I'm going to try to um, talk a little bit about, like, we try to think about, like, what are the opportunities? What are the threats? That kind of thing, like a SWOT sort of analysis, which pros and cons to that too. But okay. Here's a, here are the, a few of the threats that I see kind of happening that we really need to figure out how we do these things. One is with interprovincial and interterritorial differences in how vaccines are made eligible and why and when and whatever, it would be nice to kind of standardize some approach to that. It doesn't have to be exactly the same, but we should understand if there are meaningful differences, why are they occurring among provinces and territories, right? The other piece, though, is that, you know, and we talked about this a little bit informally, is that there is so much pressure on this on immunization systems from so many places now. And that is in some ways a threat. It's probably an opportunity if you think about it in the right way. But but, you know, vaccine manufacturers are hitting us hard now in ways that they wouldn't have before about like, we need you to advocate nationally for our vaccine to be here. And that is not the way it was done before. And so that's an important change, right? The other important changes are, um, you know, people People saying I want this vaccine and therefore I should have it as opposed to well at a system level you know is it is it you know what are the different um, trade-offs of offering this vaccine to this age group versus a different vaccine right and and those decisions used to be made kind of through a process and there are processes for them but because COVID kind of turned a lot of those processes around we're having trouble going back to them and we don't have to go back all the way right the silver lining is take some of the lessons and do it better or differently but there has to be a process and and, it ha and ha <laughs> right so so um so I would say that that's a strength, sorry, an opportunity and a threat, is that the shifting landscape means we have to shift the way we, we make decisions in our programs, but we also have to like have processes for those decision-making like things so that they're not just ad hoc or, well, somebody called someone and they want RSV, so we're just going to do it. 
right? Like, and yeah, so, so like, the, like these are the kinds of things we have to go back to, like programmatic decision making, like processes for decision making. And the things that I think are great from COVID that we learned is we, we you know, even if our systems don't talk to each other that well, like we actually do. So we, we did a lot of reach outs. There were lots of engagements, lots of relational, you know, things that have been built that were kind of in a way to overcome the fact that our systems don't talk to each other. And we now have an opportunity to do both, to talk to each other and build relationships and all also to build systems that talk to each other. If I could just add to that. Um, so in Alberta, prior to the, to the pandemic, we had a group that would meet that, that had representatives from pharmacy and the medical field and public health and indigenous, and, and we all worked together to develop an influenza policy. So we took that group and, and moved it into the COVID landscape and they were so valuable. So what, what we're going to do with that group now is say, okay, in this changing landscape, work with us and, and, and help us develop some policies and, and help us take a look at areas and weaknesses and gaps that we can close based on, on the lens in which you provide immunization services in Alberta. So that's just one of the other silver linings that I wanted to mention. If I could just add for Manitoba, I, like, I generally don't like to make predictions because invariably you're going to be wrong, you know, uh, if you're lucky only half the time. Um, but I think in the short term, we're going to experience, you know, a number of continuing challenges. As I mentioned, you know, human resource wise for primary care, if they're in the immunization you know, healthcare delivery model for early childhood immunizations. Uh, I don't think that there's a jurisdiction in Canada that is not experiencing a primary care shortage um, right now. And it's just the degree of shortage is just the only difference between jurisdictions across Canada. So, uh, you know, I think that that is going to remain an issue. And, you know, there's always the tyranny of the acute, like what is the most pressing need for that specific visit at that time? And, you know, the, um, you know, the challenge with prevention is that, you know, it's something that hasn't happened yet. And you're, you know, the, you, you are focusing on dealing with the challenges that the person is currently experiencing. So, you know, it always gets pushed to kind of the bottom of the pile, uh, which, you know, if there's less and less time for more and more people, then, you know, that is just always going to be a challenge. And then, you know, with our public health uh, staff, then as Morig already said, you know, we have so many other challenges at this time. You know, one of the main ones being the rising rates in sexually transmitted infections and bloodborne infections. So, you know, uh, in Manitoba specifically, syphilis, HIV are, you know, really um, at, you know, just escalating levels and, you know, congenital syphilis for the negative outcomes from syphilis and then our, you know, rising rates of HIV, the trajectory that that's on, these are, you know, really, really, uh, you know, impressing, pressing and important concerns. And so if you've got time dedicated to those, um, you know, really significant challenges, you just have less time for other things, which would include immunizations and all the other important things that public health does um, in Manitoba and in other jurisdictions. So. Uh, you know, I think that there's going to be those challenges and the, the people that are likely going to be impacted the most are the people that are already having the hardest time accessing care because they're, you know, the people without primary care are going to be the people that are already experiencing challenges um, more disproportionately than others. Uh, those uh, families that do require more time to be able to answer their questions, you know, I don't know if that time is going to be there because the time is going to be focused on other things. So I think that that is going to be a specific challenge for a number of years. Um, you know, on the flip side, one of the benefits is those uh, those relationships that were built with all of these different groups that may not have had those same relationships with all these different, uh, you know, newcomer, uh, religious, you know, uh, other cultural and, you know, other different organizations that hopefully can 
um, push back against those challenges to try to expand the circle of people that are uh, working with us to try to um, protect these children and, and others, uh, you know, adult, adults and others in um, our communities. And from Saskatchewan, I'd just like to say that um, we are looking at different ways to enhance our registry. Um, like Monica said, the digital, digitalized consent or is electronic consent. Um, we are exploring that. We're in the exploratory phase. Also, as Devinder just mentioned about newcomers, um, there's been many, many new relationships developed with newcomer agencies. We have to determine a better way to work with them and also provide information to them in their own language and in a culturally competent and safe way. Um, our First Nations communities, there's been a lot of work done. We have Northern Intertribal Health Authority who is translating a lot of the information into Cree and Dene so that um, they can reach those people. Um, they work with communities very closely and a lot of their um, work that they're doing to increase immunization rates are at the community level and the community is very involved in these initiatives which makes a big difference. The Saskatchewan Health Authority has also developed a provincial uptake working group and they're developing a provincial tool so that every area can use that tool that will have different strategies to increase immunization rates. So there is a lot of work out there and I'm <clears throat> really proud to say that Saskatchewan is pushing forward on this, and I know it's really difficult because of the capacity issues, but they are doing their very, very best. Thanks. Thank you so much. So I'm seeing the countdown. We're at the last, uh, last few seconds, but any, any last remarks by anyone on the panel? Well, I, I will thank you all so much for taking the time and joining us here today. I think we all learned and, and gained a wealth of information from all of you and, and sharing your perspectives. So thank you so much for being with us today. Great. So thanks, everyone. So we just have a few more uh, short presentations before we take a break. So I'm, I'm going to welcome our three uh, poster presenters to the stage. So first, we're going to start with uh, Gravier uh, to share his poster. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Yervir, and today I'll be presenting on our project, which explored the slower uptake of the COVID-19 vaccine among young adults living in island health. So in general, young adults aged 20 to 29 years old initially had a slower uptake of the COVID-19 vaccine relative to older adults and in the island health authority compared to the Vancouver coastal health region. For many young adults within this demographic, the COVID-19 vaccine may have been the first time deciding about a vaccine independently of their parents or guardians. Therefore, exploring and identifying any form of vaccine hesitancy among young adults in their 20s is important not only for herd immunity, but to help these individuals establish healthy vaccination patterns for the rest of their lives. Therefore. We explored the reasons why young adults aged 20 to 29 years old living in the Island Health Authority region had a slower uptake of the COVID-19 vaccine compared to older adults. We recruited 25 young adults, 17 women and eight men to participate in semi-structured interviews approximately 60 minutes in length. These 25 key informant interviews were subsequently analyzed using thematic analysis, which generally consisted of iteratively identifying, redefining, and summarizing results into themes as they related to the study objective. Based on what we heard from our participants, there were three main categories of reasons which resulted in a slower uptake of the COVID-19 vaccine within this demographic. These were as follows. Uh, one, there being um, a general view that the perceived risks of COVID-19 did not justify the efforts needed to go and get the vaccine. Number two, there being a lack of trust in the vaccine due to general fear, as well as um, general uh, safety and perceived lack of vaccine effectiveness. And lastly, there being a lack of urgency due to feeling burnt out or exhausted by the COVID-19 pandemic. In general, 
Participants stress the importance of improving vaccine communication targeting the young adult population. Participants underline the importance of improving the content of vaccine messaging by ensuring the content of messaging attracts and keeps their readers' attention, such as by debunking common misconceptions, as well as outlining incentives to get vaccinated or using celebrities or um, pop stars, famous individuals. They also suggested that the messaging is clear about the <clears throat> individual advantages and social responsibility of getting vaccinated, and the messaging provides a direct way to register for vaccination rather than requiring people to look it up. Our participants also stressed the need to use appropriate messengers of vaccine information, such as those who are deemed credible based on education and credentials, are relatable to the demographics, such as being of the same age, uh, ethnicity, and gender, and those who have pre uh, previous personal lived experience with COVID-19. Overall, the key takeaway of our project was that the decreased perceived risk of COVID-19, lack of trust, and lack of urgency contributed to a slower uptake of the COVID-19 vaccination among young adults aged 20 to 29 years old living in the Allen Health region, and that tailoring vaccine information to young adult demographics and using trusted and relatable sources to deliver it may facilitate swifter uptake of future vaccinations. So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. And if anyone has any questions, feel free to email me. Uh, my email is there. Thank you. Thank you, Gravier. Um, and I'll welcome Robin to the stage. Thank you, it is a privilege to be here. I respectfully would like to acknowledge the traditional territories of the Wakongan people on Vancouver Island, and that's where I live, and have been graciously welcomed to seek knowledge. I'm sharing with you today a qualitative descriptive study conducted as a part of a PhD research supervised by Dr. Shannon McDonald, University of Alberta. So first off, just to focus us on a couple of terms, uh, intersectionality is the interconnection of social demographics, and as a theoretical approach, it acknowledges overlapping and interdependent systems of discrimination. And secondly, uh, an ethnocultural group uh, is defined by shared characteristics that are unique to that group, such as country of origin, language, ethnicity, or cultural traditions. And as we know, some ethnocultural groups in Canada experience low childhood vaccination rates. Inequities have been attributed to differential constraints to accessing services, culturally irrelevant care, uh, and experience of discrimination, among others. So therefore, the objective of this study was to descriptively explore how intersections of ethnocultural identities and social locations influenced parents' perceptions and their access to childhood vaccination during the pandemic. And the sample included 17 parents of children 2 to 11 years old. We had 11 newcomers, four self-identified as Indigenous, and 13 as a racialized minority. And two were second-generation immigrants, and 11 primarily spoke a, a minority language most often. The semi-structured interviews occurred February, March of last year. And parents described uh, their previous experiences of vaccination in another country of origin and beliefs and perceptions about childhood vaccines and their experiences when accessing services here in Canada during the pandemic. And parents also shared experiences of discrimination. So during the pandemic, we had 16 parents vaccinate their children with routine vaccines, 10 against influenza and COVID-19 vaccines, and one expressed non-acceptance of all vaccines with no future intention. Uh, nine parents also had delays in vaccination due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and three parents shared experiences of discrimination when accessing health services. So five themes emerged through descriptive thematic analysis. And the first theme, newcomers really found vaccinations accessible in Canada, yet unfamiliarity with the processes created an uncertainty that did create significant barriers to access. Secondly, recent newcomers, so those that came 2019 and, and later, uh, they experienced further challenges navigating vaccination 
And those were really described as being due to a lack of family or social supports here in Canada. And the third theme, uh, ethnocultural diversity was described by parents as a protective factor against racialized discrimination in healthcare. The fourth, vaccination inclusivity, it really consisted of normalization and socialization processes. It was far more than just a convenient location. And lastly, Polarized perceptions really placed high importance on routine vaccines, but parents said specifically that because of the COVID-19 pandemic, they experienced increased hesitancy or uncertainty towards influenza and COVID-19 vaccines. So the implication public health messages are needed to address polarized perceptions towards different vaccines, inclusive vaccines for parents of diverse ethnocultural identities and social locations. It includes strength-based, and culturally relevant approaches. It preemptively addresses international differences in vaccination, and it includes normalization and socialization of vaccination. So thank you to co-authors, Drs. Joanne Olson, Dr. Ev Dubay, Dr. Shannon Scott, and Dr. Shannon McDonald. Thank you so much, Robin. And I'd like to introduce uh, Ruth Nielsen. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me here today. My name is Ruth Nielsen. I'm here on behalf of the Understanding UConnor's Attitudes Towards Vaccines project. This project is a collaboration between Council of Yukon First Nations, One Yukon Coalition, and Yukon University, and in partnership with the Champaign and Asiac First Nations and Selkirk First Nation. In this project, we are really looking to understand how Yukoners make decisions about COVID-19 and flu vaccines. We want to learn where Yukoners get their information, who Yukoners trust, who they don't trust for information about vaccines, and how these influence overall um, attitudes towards COVID-19 and flu vaccines. This project started um, from work done out of the Yukon First Nations COVID-19 response team. This was an, a grassroots initiative on the ground, um, organizing communication around COVID-19, the pandemic broadly, and then vaccines specifically. This working group saw a lot of incredible work um, as far as community level information sharing and community leadership. And coming to 2022, what this resulted in um, was some really high vaccination rates in some of our Yukon nor rural, rural, remote, and northern Yukon communities. What we see now, though, are some high differences in vaccination, with some communities having very high vaccination and some communities having quite low vaccination. And so our team wants to know where do these differences come from? So our project goals um, go from very broad to quite narrow, uh, looking at the national level, international level, to the community level. Most broadly, we want to contribute Yukon voice to national and international data landscapes on uh, vaccine uptake, vaccine hesitancy. More closely, we want, to hear, we want to improve, explore, and build understanding of those factors, those community-level factors and territorial-level factors that influence vaccine decision-making. And then at the really close community level, we want to help our Yukon communities prepare for future health emergencies. So how are we going to do that? We have three main phases. Right now, we are in phase one, which are community-based conversations. So these look like one-on-one um, -on -one interviews and focus groups with Yukon First Nations community members to learn about that individual uh, vaccine decision-making. In phase two, which we hope to start uh, towards the end of the summer into fall of this year, we'll be doing a territory-wide survey. And then we're going to learn, take the learning from both of those phases uh, and work with our community partners to no mobilize that knowledge into action and create community-led initiatives that support vaccine uptake. Finally, our project is really grounded in four main principles, um, and those are in collaboration, health equity, 
reconciliation, and data sovereignty. I know this is a bit of a busy slide. I'm not going to read it, but I do hope to see you at our poster presentation so I can go into each of these in more detail. And with that, I will say thank you. Um, I am just one member of a very large team. I have two, other of our, two others of our team members here. And so I hope that you will visit us at the poster presentation so we can share more about this project. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ruth, and thank you to the three of you for presenting your posters. And I do hope that everyone will take an opportunity to go uh, see their posters and ask more questions. And they are all uh, displayed uh, across from room C420. So I hope you'll take an opportunity to the breaks to go see their posters. Um, so we are about to break, but I do have some housekeeping uh, pieces to mention to everyone. Um, so you should have a color indicated on your badge for the sessions following the break. So for blue badges, please return here. Um, for yellow badges, please meet in room C400, directly across from the re registration table. And then for green badges, please gather in room C420, across from the poster displays. Um, so there'll be some refreshments in the foyer, and yeah, please enjoy your break, and we'll see you back at 11.